My father was a big influence on me. He served in the Navy in World War II on a destroyer escort, and later he stayed in the Navy Reserve. He never let go of the Navy, and he was a member of the Naval Institute. And at our home in Chicago, we did have a little library type area with some bookshelves, and those shelves were just full of proceedings magazines and naval history books, most of which were from the Naval Institute Press. All those articles and all those books and my father himself influenced me to join the Navy. I applied for ROTC scholarship, went to College of the Holy Cross. I served on a variety of platforms. A lot of fun was a small hydrofoil that thing could go 45 knots in cruise and over 62 knots when you got to full, full throttle. And uh, we did a lot of drug ops, embarked Coast Guard Lidettes. Another ship that was tremendously important to me was command of the USS Russell. I was very fortunate to be selected as the first commanding officer. And we ultimately deployed to the Persian Gulf. We participated in Tomahawk strikes and Operation Desert Strike and also did uh, UN sanctions, enforced UN sanctions against Iraq. The last thing I got to do at sea was to command a carrier strike group, the USS Nimitz Strike Group. The carrier Strike Group has the aircraft carrier, has an air wing of over 60 tactical aircraft, a cruiser for air defense, and a few guided missile destroyers. It's about 8,000 people, and that's the best thing you're able to do at sea as a flag officer. We deployed to the Gulf, we did combat operations against Iraq in 2005, and on board we had a film crew that filmed five of the six months of deployment, and that eventually became a 10-part series on PBS called Carrier. Talking about experiences in the Navy, we moved over 20 times. It was my wife, Jane, who really made every place we lived a home. And I can't tell you how important that was. I know, deep down, I would not have been a success as a naval officer without her support. For me, home was always where Jane was. When it came time to get to the end of the career, the Navy encouraged us to not take the first thing that comes along, really consider our options. And the first day I was CEO of the Naval Institute was my last day on active duty. Right here on the yard of the U.S. Naval Academy in 1873, a group of Navy and Marine officers met. They looked at the progress that the U.S. Navy was making vis-a-vis -vis other navies, particularly European navies, and said, wow, we are not in the game technologically, conceptually. And they assessed that their own navy was very hidebound. Ideas really only came one way, and there weren't enough of them. And they decided they needed ideas to move up and down the chain of command. They clearly wanted to embrace the idea that it wasn't based on what you were wearing here for rank, it was based on what you were wearing here for ideas. And they founded the United States Naval Institute in 1873, and in 1874, volume one, number one of the Naval Institute proceeding was published, one of the oldest, continually published magazines in the United States today. And the Navy and the nation needed a independent, nonpartisan, open forum, and they still need one today. The Naval Institute Press was founded in 1898 and publishes over 100 books a year with a focus on history, biography, and current affairs, and the occasional novel. We pioneered the techno-thriller genre when we published Hunt for Red October by then unknown author Tom Clancy. We also published the Blue Jackets Manual since 1902, and it's the Bible for every Navy recruit. And we also publish the professional books that guide the other services, like the Marine Officer's Guide, or the Marine Non-Commissioned Officer's Handbook, and the Coast Guardsman Manual. We also have a very strong USNI News journalist feed. It's become a must read in the national security circuit and it comes out Monday through Friday and that was a big leap for us to get into journalism. 
In many ways, the Naval Institute was the conscience of the Navy and the other services on important issues such as racial integration and the expanded role of women. And that takes us right down to the present day. Accomplishments I'm the most proud of over the last seven years is proceedings getting its swagger back. It is the heart of our forum. We also revitalized our essay program. If you look back at the early history of the Institute, was the cornerstone of our efforts to draw in submissions and engage people who were the practitioners in the fleet and the Marine Corps. We've increased the quality of our conference events through better speakers and, frankly, adding more edge. One of the most important aspects of the Naval Institute itself is the power to convene, to pick a topic and say, let's discuss this. Our institute is a nonprofit. It's a 501c3, and we get no appropriated money even though we have a very official sounding name and even though we're located at the U.S. Naval Academy, we do not get any underwriting from the U.S. government or from the taxpayers. We do have a foundation and that foundation has performed magnificently in the last seven years and that bodes very well for the future. We are embarked on a major project to build a 400-seat comfort center on the yard at the U.S. Naval Academy next to our headquarters building at Beach Hall. It's going to be optimized for professional symposia and for the first time provide us a home field for our engagement activities. For the future, we're also embarked on a massive technology project and the last frontier for us is the image collection. We have at 500,000 plus the largest collection of military photos that is private and we've done now over a hundred thousand of those images. That project and all the other aspects of it are going to yield a modern Naval Institute that's able to repurpose and repackage content. The mission of the Naval Institute is to provide an independent forum for those who dare to read, think, speak, and write to advance the professional, literary and scientific understanding of sea power and other issues critical to global security. Our vision is to give voice to those who seek the finest Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard.